Last week we talked about stewardship of the gifts that we have, about using what we have for a greater good. This week we're going to take that one step further because to use it means you have to risk it. Now, one of the identifiers I've, I see in our culture today is a it's not my fault idea. This seems to be a theme that runs throughout. It's not my fault. I might have done it, but it's not my fault. I might have caused it, but it's not my fault. It's always somebody else's fault. Now, before we get too judgmental about people in our culture today, remember that it was the same issue that Adam and Eve had. Adam said, Lord, I ate the apple, but it's not my fault. And Eve said, uh, yeah, I gave the apple to Adam, but it's not my fault. And the serpent, well, the serpent was just snuggered. <laughs> this passage this morning is about taking responsibility. To responsibly and faithfully steward the gifts that are given to us. Now, first of all, let's take a look at the story. The figures used in the translation that I used this morning, which is the message, it's the most recent Bible translation, talk about actual dollar sums, $5,000, $2,000, and $1,000. In the actual, in a better translation, that's done so that it's, it's comprehensible, so that it's understandable to those reading. But a better translation in this case is actually, many of you may know this, talents. 5,000 talents, 2,000 talents, and 1,000 talents. Now, there is a big difference between $5,000 and 5,000 talents. And so I, wanna, I wanted to make sure that you understood this. One talent in the day of Jesus represented about 20 years' wages for a common laborer. 20 years. One talent. So that means if the first servant is given 5,000 talents, he is given 100 years' worth of wages for an average <coughs> laborer. 100. Did I say 1,000? I said 100. Okay, sorry. 100 years' wages. The second servant is given 40 years' worth of wages. Essentially, a whole career in one shot. And the third is given 20 years' worth of wages. Now the first two, so you, you get an idea of the sums involved here. The, the $5,000 actually pales in comparison to the 5,000 talents. And the first two set to work right off. The master hasn't even left yet. And they are off making more money. Making the master's money work. The third one simply buries it in the ground. His reason? He's very clear. I know you're a harsh man, Master, and I know you expect the most from those whom you entrust, but I was afraid that I might disappoint you. There is the crux of this passage. So because look what happens. The first two are commended. The traditional translation says, well done, good and faithful servants. Come in to your father's rest. The first two are commended. They are given rest. But uh, there's where I like the modern passage. Where he says, good work, you did your job well. From now on, be my partner. So the rest sounds like it's a reward. Okay, you've done your bit, now you can just go and lay down and relax, you know, recline on one arm and eat grapes and enjoy yourself. But this idea, good job, from now on be my partner, says something completely different. It says that these servants are no longer servants. They are now called to be co-decision makers with the master. They are called to work with the master for a greater end. The third one is afraid of disappointing. And because he is afraid, he loses not just an opportunity to be a co-decision maker with the master. 
He loses the opportunity to no longer be a servant, but to be a partner. He also, because he refused to risk, lost everything. Throw him out into outer darkness, the master says. Because he wouldn't take the risk, he lost everything. Because he held his hands tight, thinking he could hold on to what he had, he lost everything. Now, I'm going to be bold here. You can yell at me later if you want, that's fine. But most churches, while we commend the first two servants, we say with Jesus, well done, good and faithful servants, we actually imitate the third. We bury our talents in the ground. We hold on, we seek, the same thing that the third servant sought, stability. We want things to be stable. We want the waters to be calm and the sailing to be smooth. But you can't have smooth waters if you're taking risks. The two don't work together. So while we commend with Jesus the first two servants saying, well done, good and faithful servants, we imitate the third. Let's take a look at this. What talents have been given to us as Central United Church? Let's be specific. This isn't just pie-in-the-sky theology. Let's, let's be real. What's been given to us? Well, first of all, one of the most obvious gifts we have been given is about $200,000 a year. That's your hard-earned money. That's the hard-earned money of others. The church receives this every year through your offerings, mainly through offerings, but also through uh, facility rentals, uh, which creates risk again because we're not quite sure. We, we, in a sense, when we rent out our property, we lose control of our property even for a short time. So there is a risk involved there. We have, within this congregation, one of the, the, I think, the greatest gifts we have here is the gift of music. We have a group here that works diligently, providing a style of music that is, that is calming, that is uplifting, that is joy-filled. We've got another group within this church called the Messiah's Misfits that like to rock it out. You know, we like to make a lot of noise. I'm not going to say we're necessarily good at it, but boy, do we love making noise. You, know, you have a wonderful group of musicians that will lead worship music in various styles. We have guests, guest musicians uh, that come and offer their gifts in the moments that are needed. And these are wonderful gifts that we see. We have, which some of you may or may not see, but we have leaders in this church who have a great knowledge of where we've come from of leaders who have an understanding of the gifts that have been entrusted to them. We have a hard-working staff. And this is the one that I love the most, and I am so grateful to be a part of this. We have, as Central United Church, a desire to connect with the local community. Not just a desire, but the will to do so. That's important because every church wants to be relevant in the community. Every church doesn't want to just be a gathering of people that are taking up space in the neighborhood. Every church wants to have an impact. They have the desire. But not every church has the will. And it's taking those steps to make things happen. For example, the in out of the cold was making something happen. You're living out the desire to connect with the community. But we didn't just become a mission church or a missional church seeking to help other people, but we also connected with the local business community. And people are fostering connections in different places, in very places throughout the life of St. Thomas. It's not just the desire to connect, but it's the will to connect. And folks, I can't lift this up enough. I cannot say this enough. I cannot commend us enough for this will. 
However, these are only the noticed gifts. What about the stuff we don't see? We have gifted artists within our church. But would you know that by looking at our space? We have a number of other musicians within our church. Oh, I didn't forget to also lift up the junior choir there as well, providing another style of music in, in a wonderful, heart-lifting, heart-warming way. But we have many gifted musicians in our church, but we don't hear them. We have, within our church, potential young leaders with bold visions about the possibilities for tomorrow. But often, we don't see their influence. We have talents that are amazing within this congregation. You folks sitting here right now all have your talents. A lot of them we don't know. The rest of us don't know. We don't see them. This is a twofold, I don't want to say family because that's a little strong. I don't want to sound judgmental, but a twofold missing the mark. If the church isn't seeking the gifts and the talents of the people within, then it is not living out its potential. And if you are hiding your talents, well, what good are they buried in the ground? What good? was the thousand talents buried in the ground. It did nothing. It achieved nothing. It accomplished nothing. It became nothing. The gospel makes it very, very clear, my friends. We all are given the opportunity, the potential to impact the world around us. Every one of us as individuals has the opportunity to influence and impact other people's lives. But when you bring all that potential together into one group, well, to quote Jesus, the gates of hell cannot stand against it. If we haven't sought that potential, we've missed our opportunity. If you haven't shared that potential, then you've missed the opportunity. You've missed not only the opportunity to grow yourself, but to help others grow. This is why Paul talks about bringing your gifts together so that all may grow, and this is a direct quote, all may grow in the fullness and likeness of Jesus Christ. If talents aren't being shared, for whatever reason they're not being shared, we miss an opportunity to grow even more in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, is what church is about. It's about growing in the likeness of Christ. It's not coming and hearing a good message, although I hope it is a good message. It's not coming and hearing a good choir. We're not a spectator sport. We're a community. And when we gather our gifts together, incredible things can happen. But if we keep our talents buried, then nothing happens. Now, I want to talk about one more thing because I, I wish that there was a fourth servant in Jesus' story. That fourth servant would be given X amount of talents, whatever the sum may be. And he, like the first two, goes and risks it all, seeking to double the investment. Now you think, how do you double an investment? What can you do to double your investment? You can't invest it in safe and secure stocks and bonds. That's not going to double it quickly. Flipping a coin might do it. That'll double it quickly if you're lucky enough. But these guys did something. They risked it to double it. Now the fourth servant that's not listed that I wish was in this story does the same thing. He takes his talents and he risks it all and he loses. How do you think Jesus would respond? This is a crucial question, my friends. This is a crucial question because if we think that Jesus would respond with anger and judgment and condemnation, 
then we are going to follow the safe example of the third servant. If we think that Jesus is going to condemn us or judge us for not playing it safe, for risking it all and losing it, then the only option is to play it safe. But I like to think, I believe within my heart of hearts that Jesus would say to that fourth servant who risked it all, who laid it on the line and lost it, that he would say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and be my partner. So it's not the sums. The 5,000 isn't commended because he made 5,000 more. The 5,000 talent servant is commended because he took the risks. Now, when churches seriously look at people's talents, seriously seek to grow everybody who is a part of the community and seeks to grow because of the talents of everybody in the community, then incredible, wonderful things can happen. But also, bad things can happen. I'm not going to lie to you. When you flip the coin, you may be hoping for heads, but you might get tails. And sometimes when people use their gifts, things go awry. And I think that that is where churches become the most frightened. Because we're not quite sure how we're going to deal with the situation if it's gone awry. We're not quite sure how we're going to deal with the person who has caused the situation to go awry. And so, if we just maintain a sense of stability, if we bury talents in the ground, we'll be okay. We may be a time. It might be a year. It might be ten years. It might be a hundred years. But it's only a time. If instead we learn how to be community together, to use people's gifts and to take the risk, to take the risk, whether things go right or wrong, that we're all going to grow. Powerful things begin to happen. Lives are changed for the better. Destinies are altered. The 12, who I argue changed the world 2,000 years ago in the spirit of the one, the 12 risked it all, laid it all on the line for the sake of the one. Look where we are now. That's not because somebody decided to play it safe. We wouldn't be here today if a servant decided to bury the talents in the ground. We wouldn't be here today if people weren't willing to say, I'll risk everything for the sake of the gospel. We wouldn't be here today. Where will our great grandchildren? Will we be just as a church a memory to them of what once was? Maybe a building standing there that has long since ceased to be used? Or will we make an impact on our great-grandchildren because we decided to take the risks that needed to happen for us to grow in the likeness and fullness of Jesus Christ? I want it said to me when I stand before my maker on that day, whatever it may be, I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come, be my partner. But more than that, I want the churches to hear the same thing. I want the churches to hear from Jesus, you have done well. Whether you won or lost, you have done well by risking what I gave you for the sake of the gospel. Well done. Come be my partner. Amen.